Hi, everybody. Um, I am not going to chat so much right to start sure. off with. Um, I'm just going to get started. And um, what I did was I soaked some rice. I soaked that last night, uh, the night before. And um, this particular rice that I have here, this is Cota Farms, and um, it's an Italian farro that I had it mixed with. So I'm going to boil this. And ideally, is um, I soaked the farro because this particular farro uh, requires some soaking. If it's pearl farro, it does not. But if it's not pearl farro, then you do need to soak it. And this is going to look just like this. As you can see, there's it's a little bit cloudy in there. Uh, oops, did I just like drop some? Oh, we'll just hope that it's okay. I'll splash back. And I'm going to take this and I'm going to turn on the flame. So this is going to require, uh, normally a lot of people say that brown rice needs about uh, an hour to cook when it's boiled or in the doname pot. Uh, I usually cook it a little bit less, which I'll explain, but I just like want to put it on right now so that we finish in time. So that's going here. And this is in a Le Creuset pot, so it's porcelain covered cast iron. You can see that, and we're going to do this in a Le Creuset. Now, I'm going to more um, like polished, partially refined, and the whole grain of brown rice. So I'm going to do this in the heavier pot. If I was, my first preference for rice is actually to use the urban water donabe. So if you don't have one, this one is a matte finish. I have one that is another lid that fits inside and then one that fits on top of that, which I'll explain how to use that. And it gives a very light, fluffy texture for rice. So just let me get this on first <clears throat> and then we'll take it from there. So here I have some more brown rice soaking. So ideally, my preference is to soak at night. And you can take that up to like 20 some hours, like about 21, 22. If it starts to smell a little bit and smells like dirty socks, <laughs> um, which can happen if the weather's really warm out, then, you know, it's not going to be very good. But this is perfectly fine. And then I have a second grain here, and that's bulgur wheat. So that's uh, a, part, a cracked grain. We'll put that there. And then I should have half cup there because that was a quarter cup. Yeah. Half cup measured out. And the way this works, all the little flame deflectors there. I'm going to start this off in the back. And we get this a tiny pinch of salt. This just gets a little bit of salt stuck to my hands there because they're wet. And then the little lid with two holes goes on first. I like to line that up with the two handles right here. And then this goes on top. And then it goes directly on the flame. You don't soak in this pot. If you were to soak in this pot, you could run risk of this cracking. Because even when you're even when you're um, cooking this, uh, when you finish cooking, you don't soak it right away like you might with like some other things. What you do is you have to let that cool down completely. Because again, you could run risk of, of this pot cracking. So they are kind of delicate. And they take some time, but it's really my preference to cook rice um, and other grains like barley stews go well in there, farro, um, 
haven't done too many crack things directly in that. Uh, we either use stainless for that, and again, as I move along, I can explain that to you. But it's the compromise between boiling and pressure cooking. So initially, when a lot of you probably started practicing macrobiotics, it was a big thing to pressure cook your brown rice. And that's the way most people liked it. Uh, I've had brown rice that was pressure cooked already that it was just as dry as can be and I didn't like it. So my preference was always um, for boiled brown rice. So even though, you know, like um, I had studied at the Fushi Institute and they were predominantly pressure cooking at home, I would mainly boil my brown rice. So um, I think that it's a little bit lighter and more relaxed texture than that of pressure cooking. But the advantage to pressure cook brown rice would be that it has that very glutinous uh, consistency and you can very easily cook beans with that type of rice. But a number of years ago, I pretty much, as soon as I got like this particular pot, I started using it right away and I haven't gone back, um, almost never pressure cook brown rice anymore. I think I did when I was making rice cream for somebody. Um, and I think I also did when I made, um, made an azuki bean rice for something or a sweet rice, but I haven't used it in a whole lot of years. I do like to pressure cook beans because they cooks very quickly. So boiling is a little bit different in that you're using more water when you boil. So the ratio for boiled rice is two to one and that holds fast whether you're making white rice or whether you're making a brown rice or a brown rice combination so it's always two to one so for example if you have one cup total grain then you're going to use two cups of liquid two cups of water pressure cooking is a little bit different that was either um for every one cup total of grain you could go like one and a quarter or up to like one and a third and then the ratio was a little bit different if you were adding a bean to it that could be like your starting point could be like one and a half cups um, of water for one cup of grain to like up to two my preference there was like always like two cups was too much but one and a half sometimes again depending on what you were cooking with that was just not quite enough the beauty of this pot right here is it's because you're using a two to one ratio here you almost really can't screw it up. Um, the only thing that would mess it up is if you left it on the flame too long, you forgot to put the timer on, and then you made it, it may hang fast to the bottom. If it does hang fast to the bottom, then you need to like uh, let it cool down completely because you can't put water in it right away. And then you're going to need to just like soak it um, and soak it for a really long time up until the point where you can actually like get it to like come out of there. So I have a boil here. This is boiling already. And I'm going to now, actually, when I boil, I wait to salt my grain. And then I'm going to lower the flame completely. And I'm showing this because I have been recommending boiling more and less pressure cooking um, over the last number of years, but not everyone has a donami pot. So it's like this, good to show this. And then we're just gonna move this over to here. And I'm going to like see my timer here. And I'm gonna time that, grab my phone here. And then we're gonna keep track. So you can use little egg timers, or if you have a phone, you can you know, like use your phone for this. But I would say, I'm gonna check this in about 50 minutes. So I just think that that's about how long it's gonna take and it's gonna help if I turn my ringer back on. This, on the other hand, because I'm using a crack brain, that will cook very easily in 40 minutes. Um, generally speaking, it's not going to get mushy or anything like that, because people always ask that, like, well, if you put a crack brain in the brown rice, is it going to get mushy? Doesn't. I make this combination a lot. It's one of my favorite combinations. It's bulgur wheat, 
cooked with brown rice and um, gives a very light consistency. But uh, for those of you who want a gluten-free option, you can also do quinoa. So now both of those grains cook in about 20 minutes, as in like quinoa takes about 20 minutes, bulgur wheat takes about 20 minutes. But in brown rice, it's so unique that everything when you're cooking brown rice actually adjusts its cooking time to that of the brown rice. So for example, if you're cooking, you know, well, I just showed you an example here, but even if you're pressure cooking and you're doing a bean that may take a lot longer, it miraculously adjusts to the brown rice. So of all the whole cereal grains, brown rice is the most balanced. And I know more recently, like in a lot of, there's been a lot of discussion around like, oh, too much brown rice, too much brown rice. Um, I would agree that like a lot of people ate way too much brown rice um, back in the day when they first started practicing macrobiotics. But um, the way I look at it is, I think it's because like the quantity was just so much. Uh, Michu and Aveline Kushi came up with that looked almost like a plate, the diagram that was like a, a K, so to speak. And it looked like, you know, like they thought that your diet should consist of like 40 to 60% grain. And that's kind of like a lot of grain, um, way too much for a lot of people. So I was never personally one to eat a large quantity of grain, but literally I would see people in seminars, I would see people at conferences that their whole plate, half of that plate was grain. That would never work for me. <laughs> I would be way too much. Um, now, granted, like if that was a plate of maybe pasta or a um, couscous, you know, like I could eat a little bit more on that because it's much lighter. But again, that's still like a whole lot of grain. So I guess I didn't like tire of it a as much. So I do still eat brown rice. I don't necessarily eat brown rice every day, but it is the most balanced of all the whole cereal grains. And it combines well with everything. So it does have a lot of strength and a lot of vitality and a lot to offer. I just think it's like more of the way people have used it over the years. And my feeling is also that when you cook your brown rice, we have always recommended that you cook it together with another grain or a bean. That more or less helps balance things out and makes the brown rice just a little bit lighter. But when you're cooking it in preparation like this, it's going to give a lighter um, texture and a lighter consistency. So, uh, and especially if you're using one of the craft grains. Like I said, the gluten-free option would be quinoa. But rye is very nice. Other cracked wheat. Okay, so now we'll take this. And that's the back there. And I would time that for about 40 minutes. So here again, I'm putting that on the lowest set setting. So I'm just gonna give a peek here and try to remember what my timing is. So it's gonna take about like 40, 45 minutes. So in that time, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna like talk about a lot of different like things with brown rice and or white rice and just the different varieties and how things differ slightly. And then also, excuse me, I didn't mean to turn my back to you. Um, together with that, what my choice of um, preparation would be, like what type of cookware I would choose to use. Because I like to vary it depending on, on what I'm cooking. So right here, First, we'll talk about different types of brown rice. Uh, this is a local rice. It's called Blue Moon Rice, and it's grown in this like New Jersey. Uh, it's kind of like across the bridge, um, very close to Bucks County here. A fellow by the name of Jim Lyons has that farm that uh, we visited years ago, and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, so, incidentally, his brown rice. Um, is very, very low. It has like no arsenic in it. And so he's had like different things tested. So that's a whole other thing that people are up in arms that like, oh, there's like arsenic in brown rice and you eat all this brown rice. And that's one of the reasons that people are getting sick. You know, like, I don't know, I don't have that answer, but uh, 
I am careful about like where I source my, well, really, to be honest, where I source anything, especially like grains, beans, um, you know, like salt. What type of salt am I going to use? Um, where do I source my vegetables? Because like certain vegetables, even though they're labeled organic, they could still have like different toxins in them. They could have plastics in them that it's like really hard for the body to eliminate or they could have glyphosate in them, um, just depending on you know, like where they're grown. So I know I've always been a strong advocate to source my produce as much as possible. That's like local. I'm still getting some local produce here, which includes greens. Um, it's only recently that it's harder to find uh, locally growing baby bok choy, bok choy, or Napa cabbage. But I can get locally grown dandelion greens, uh, arugula, and lettuces. And I can also um, source locally grown uh, well, kale. But kale is one of the things that uh, I just read an article on Dr. Mercola's site about how it's like one of those vegetables that even the organic kale tends to hold on to like different toxins and different like plastics. Um, I like kale. I tend to not eat a lot of it. I like more juicy vegetables like bok choy, baby bok choy. I love watercress. I do love dandelion greens and you know, like different lettuces and, and arugula. So I tend to like roll that way a little bit more. And still like I, can get you know like some locally grown broccoli so that's really you know like i'm fortunate in that aspect so again depending on where you live you're just going to have to do your local research but this is a very high quality brown rice it's expensive but it's like anything else honestly you get what you pay for so if you're really concerned about like the quality of your food and what's in your food and how it's grown um then you're just going to have to like research it and um you know like make a decision do i want to pay a little bit more for something that i know is really high quality or you know like do i want to just like you know like pay a little bit less for a lesser quality you know like that's up to you for me like when it comes to your health and your vitality and your strength i think you just can never go wrong with spending money on you know like good quality food um the rice I use most here is Coda Farms, so Kokuo Rose. It's an heirloom grown rice. That's a California rice. And that also, I believe, has like extremely low to like no like arsenic in it. A lot of the arsenic, I believe, is found in the, the southern brown rice. Uh, and I'm not sure, I mean, I knew the answer to this, but um, if somebody wants to, um, bug me about that after the seminar, <laughs> shoot me an email and remind me and I'll do a little bit of research um, so that I would have to like research as to why. I think it was like more because of like the crops and possibly like cotton that was grown in, in the South too. Um, a lot of cotton, especially um, nowadays commercially grown cotton has like a lot of toxins in it. And I believe they do have to spray that. So. There again, that gives you like um, more of a reason to like source and think about organic cotton because ideally, you know, like cotton is like very nice and like, I think it's the nicest fabric to have like next to your skin, cotton underwear, cotton shirts, cotton sleeve clothes, etc. So coat of farm, so Kukuo Rose, K-O-K-A-O-H-U. Kuho. I can't get the big bag out of my refrigerator because I do keep it refrigerated so it keeps um, because I buy it in larger quantities of like 15 pound, 20 pound bags. It tends to be a little bit more moist than this particular brown rice, but they're both medium grain. That's also my preference, a medium grain when it comes to brown rice. I do um, enjoy some long grain brown rice in the summertime. And I will soak that a little bit, but that's not something I generally soak overnight because that also can get slightly mushy. And it does work too, like cook with other grains, but um, that one's nice sometimes like cook with a wild rice which has a very nutty flavor and they're both much more elongated. So it's just, you know, like different, something a little bit lighter 
uh, when the weather is a little bit warmer. Then we have our white rices here. So the first one here is an organic jasmine rice. And if you look at this, this is a little bit uh, more elongated. And then I keep things in glass jars. Some of it, when the weather's a little bit warmer, my kitchen tends to be cool and I like it that way. I've had people say like, oh, it's so cold in there, but that's the way I like it because when I'm working, it keeps me cool uh, and it gets like really hot otherwise. So, but like in the summer months, then oftentimes I'll just like take this whole thing and put it in the refrigerator, but you can keep things in you know, like in bags too and just like rubber band it tight so it keeps. So that's um, a jasmine white rice. This one here, and I'll hold up, that's a white basmati rice. So if I hold them side by side here, you can see the difference. This one is not quite as pointy where this one's just like a little bit thinner and a little bit pointier. Whenever I'm cooking white rice like this, then my preference is to cook it really a shorter period of time. And the first step I do is I wash it and I wash it really, really well. Meaning that I'll pour it in a thing and I'll pour water in here and then I move my hand one direction and the other direction and I'll use my hand as a sieve. Or you could put a mat on it and pour the water off like that or you could use a colander, but mat works really great. And then I'll keep putting fresh water in and rinsing it until this becomes more clear. White rice tends to give off a lot of starch and that's that white stuff. And when you cook your rice, then like, you know, like oftentimes if you go into a Japanese restaurant, um, like the, the rice can be maybe either a, a little sticky or the rice can be uh, slightly um, like just like fluffy. So my preference is for something to be just like a little bit more fluffy. You get a more fluffy texture if you rinse it and rinse out a lot of that white starch that comes in there. And then I measure off fresh water. White rice, my preference is stainless. So this is a little heavier bottom because this is a, um, a commercial grade pot. So I have like a very heavy bottom here, but um, any good quality stainless steel would work really, really well. I forget what the high-end one is. Um, I don't own any one. I have mostly Cuisinart and then some professional one. Um, gosh, I can't. It's like slipping my mind. One that most people have. But um, that will work just fine. And then I usually wait for it to come to a boil. I'll turn the flame when I wait for it to come to a boil. So I'll do it with the lid off. And then I it with a pinch of salt. Then I lower the flame, put the lid on, and move it on to a flame deflector. So it's not flame deflector. So if you notice, even though I'm in the earthenware pot here, I have flame deflectors underneath there. Now that is not to prevent your rice from burning or sticking to the bottom. That is really to disperse the heat. So it disperses the heat and the energy. These are nice ones because they fall in half and they're easy to store. But you can get the ones with the wooden handles. The wooden handles sometimes extends in here. And if you're in a larger pot, then um, it just doesn't work as well because that like sticks up. Well, this is more flat. So a larger pot will cover this area and that'll be perfectly fine. The other disadvantage of the wooden handle is oftentimes they will burn off um, very, very easily. Uh, when we had the school, because we were on a commercial stove and we'd always, you know, like we would start things in the front of the stove and then move it to the back because, you know, like you're cooking your rice, you know, like maybe like 50 minutes or even like 60 minutes, depending because, you know, like everything changes in quantities. So we would purposely burn that little um, wooden handle off and that way it would like comfortably fit a larger pot and it would be more even and flat. So you don't want it like, um, 
So if this is your pot, you don't want it sitting up like that. You want it more even on the bottom. So in that case, I recommend the collapsible ones like this. Yeah, so then once it's boiling and you move this over, so white rice takes about 20 minutes to cook. The way I do this, especially with the jasmine rice, I think 20 minutes is just a little bit too long, personally. Um, it will cook, and again, it depends on like the quantity, but if you have your water measured out just perfectly, oftentimes what I'll do is I'll stop it in that last five minutes of cooking, I'll cut the flame, and I'll just leave it steam there in the pot for the last five minutes, and then immediately take it off and remove it using a wooden rice paddle. And when you go to remove something from the pot, you want to wet this. And it works nicely if you use two. So one to get the rice out, and the other then I can gently, you know, like kind of move that into the bowl. But you don't want to leave your things sitting in the pot that they're cooking in, ideally, especially white rice, because it's just going to sit there and then it's going to get heavier. So all that work you did in the ahead of time to create a more light, fluffy rice, you just undid by letting it sit in the pot. So um, you want to remove it from the pot um, just carefully. And then when you, so you put it in a serving bowl, you can cover it with a mat just like that. It keeps nice energy contained in there, allows the rice to breathe so it's not going to again sit there and get all dense and heavy um, and create condensation. So it allows just enough things to like cool down but still maintaining a, a little bit of the heat. If your kitchen's cool enough, um, white rice will need to be refrigerated with anything you don't use, but you can use white rice in the morning to make like a nice congee, or you can make like a really delicious um, fried rice with white rice, uh, rice and beans, like uh, Mexican style rice and beans, or uh, like sauteed vegetables and a little tomato and spices and that. And you can make a really nice Spanish rice. Uh, so there's just a lot of things you can do it with it. You can even take, uh, so for those of you who joined me last week, um, I did like different dishes and I finished that dish of Denny's favorites, uh, Mediterranean, with a codfish that I had cooked. And I had, had prepared some sauteed onions and some little capers and like some fresh tomatoes in there and made just like a really nice sauce then poach the fish in that particular sauce. Well, there was fish left over and I had made some white rice and beans earlier that day for lunch. So the beans were finished and um, my friends like staying here. So I just took the white rice, put a little bit of water in the pan and then took the rest of the fish juice and like cooked like the fish in there. So I had like a whole new dish and it was delicious. Um, so people really like enjoyed that. If I'm making that Portuguese fish rice stew, then um, I generally do the basmati. This is a basmati rice. That's not a California rice. This one is actually from Texas. And it's a nice rice. Then moving right along, here's another coat of farms. This is sushi rice. So sushi rice is the rice that they use for sushi. So if you look at that, it's much more short and much more consolidated, dense. So if you put them all side by side, you have something that's a little bit more long, something not quite as long in the basmati, and then something that's just like very compact. Um, that rice gets very sticky when you make it, so it's like perfect for, for sushi, because they, or, or making a rice ball, something, and then, you know, like, the Japanese restaurant, it's probably sprayed down with like some type of mirin and sugar water, but you can um, just make like a little bit of vinegar. You can lay it out to dry when you make it, vinegar it a little bit or vinegar and mirin it, and you get the same kind of effect without the sugar. So it's much healthier for you. Or you could just use it just like this. And it's going to like stick together. So uh, it adheres really nice to the, the nori. And um, then you put your toppings in and can roll it up. And then it also allows the nori to stay together in a nice compact form. And then here we have some risotto rices. 
So the first one here, you can see that's arborio. So it looks very similar to sushi rice, although this is smaller. This is a little bit longer. And then here's a different type. This one, they're both from Italy, these two. This is Arborio. This is Villone Nano. So Arborio is going to be a little bit more dense when it's cooked in a risotto. Um, a, a little bit more like a heartier risotto. So, so if you want something that's a little bit more um, less dense and a little bit more smooth and creamy, uh, then I would choose the Violone Nano. So that's a little bit different. Said so that one and that one, or oh no, it's wrong. One sushi rice, Roborio here, and Violone Nano. It's kind of interesting because I would have thought that the Violone Nano would be longer and this would be shorter, but it's not. So that's that. Um, those are all the different things. And um, you know, again, risottos cooked in just like a completely like di different ways. Let me check my time here. So what makes brown rice unique? So brown rice is unique because it can grow on both land and water. Um, I don't really know any other foods that naturally can be grown on land and water. Um, even something like watercress that grows in the water, um, they'll grow that, but that's usually like hydroponically grown. Uh, so that's you know, like a very unique quality. And as I said before, it combines well with anything and everything that um, you cook together with. It can combine, I mean, like if you have meat eaters in the family, um, um, it can actually combine well with like different like meat type of dishes. Like I'm completely not a meat eater and haven't been for like a, a, a whole lot of years. Uh, but, um, you know, like you can do that. It combines well with vegetables, combines well with beans. And there's just, you know, like a lot you can do with it. You can make soft rices. So soft rice is something that's generally made from leftover brown rice. And uh, this is a Japanese pickled plum. It's an umeboshi plum. So soft rice with a little bit of plum in it. So you just take your rice that's already been cooked. And the next day you add extra water to it and you cook it until it gets creamy. And I know some recipe books will say it like, oh, just like cook it 10 minutes. It's going to take you longer than 10 minutes much longer to make a really nice creamy soft rice. So even if you use a combination rice, um, that combination makes a delicious soft rice. So combined well with umeboshi is really helpful to strengthen your digestive system um, and makes just a nice like breakfast porridge. Uh, you can use bean rice or you could add some beans to it and that can be used at any meal. Um, just adding just a little bit of cooked beans to your soft rice. You could add umeboshi plum to that or not. You could add a little oil to that or a little bit of grated green apples. There's so many different things that you can do. And those particular dishes tend to be like very strengthening dishes. They're very specific to aid and strengthen your digestive system. But that said, White rice makes a really nice good porridge too. So especially if you're not feeling well sometimes, um, I know a lot of times like we'll recommend having soft rice with umeboshi if you're not feeling well because it gives your strength back. But personally, uh, if I don't feel well, I prefer white rice because it's just very, very light and that kind of like takes a load off of the digestive system. Uh, that's something even that I know that her veterinarians recommend for animals too. Like if they can't digest things well, you just make like a very soft porridge with white rice and it helps and like ease things the stomach. Uh, the white rice can also be combined with a little bit of umeboshi, you know, and, and it's delicious. Um, or you can make a white rice bean porridge. So there's just like a lot of different things you can do um, with rice and um, using it 
um, and the frequency of how often you want to eat something like brown rice, uh, really that depends on your personal condition and, you know, like if you need to strengthen yourself a little bit more or if you need to relax your condition, you need relaxing, then you would eat a little bit of less brown rice. You wouldn't have it like necessarily every day. Some people who really need to strengthen their condition, you know, a little bit of brown rice um, is very, very helpful. Um, but just, you know, like, again, not in large quantities. Uh, the most important thing with rice is that you chew it well, because that's the first step in digestion. It combines well in the mouth with your saliva and begins to alkalize it. And um, you just want to chew it till it gets like very um, like mushy. Um, and then you swallow that and then again, goes completely through the digestive system. So I really don't have um, much else to cover right now. This leaves a pretty long time for questions, uh, which I'm willing to take questions right now. Why do you use the soaking water and not use fresh water? Because when you soak the rice, a lot of the nutrients are released and it goes into the soaking water. So you want, you want those nutrients, so you're going to ideally use the soaking water. White rice doesn't get soaked. All righty. Let's see. How much rice, how much rice should you eat a day and how many meals? Um, like I said, that really depends on your personal condition. Um, I wouldn't eat it more than once a day. Um, and I would eat a smaller quantity. Uh, you know, um, it, it's really that, that that's a personal thing. It depends on your health. It depends on your condition. It depends on like, you know, like how long have you been practicing macrobiotics? If you've been eating brown rice every day or a couple times a day for a whole lot of years, you probably want to take a bit of a brown rice break. Um, especially if you're eating it like cooked in a certain way and you haven't been combining it with other grains and beans. Because, you know, like I think in today's age, we have to look at ways to, um, relax our condition and just like some people like they just don't do well with a lot of grains it just doesn't digest very well so the whole thing is about like being able to strengthen your digestion and have things like move through you because if things don't move through you and you get like all dry and and tight in the inside then you know like it's going to cause like some serious health problems Alrighty, our next question. We have quite a few coming in now. Uh, let's see. I was a tad bit late. What type of pot is used for brown rice? And do you use a pressure cooker for rice? Um, so I'll answer that again. I have not been using a pressure cooker wait, maybe for at least 15, maybe even 16 years and for a really long time. Um, I would use it sometimes at programs just because of the large quantities that I'm doing. But even for programs, I have large Le Creuset pots. I don't have a Donabi. I have a Donabi pot that fits comfortably at least like three cups of uncooked grain. Keep in mind that one cup of uncooked grain is going to yield, you know, like, like one cup will yield like about four cups of cooked grain. So like three cups of uncooked grain, and if you like multiply that by four, that's like a lot. Uh, anyway, I pretty much have been using this pot, the the earthenware Donabe pot. You can find some of them on Amazon. You can find that also through Toiwo Kitchen um, or possibly some other Japanese supply stores. I just like the texture. We got that as a present, um, not this particular one. Um, that one actually had belonged to my parents um, and I confiscated it <laughs> back. Um, after they had passed, but uh, I had one that uh, my brother-in-law Howard had given us, and uh, actually he gave us two that he saw in in one of the trade shows, and uh, I just 
looked at the direction at the time Yuzo was still the buyer at a scene and just asked him to read the directions because they were all in Japanese and how to um and that's actually a good question so you have to actually season these pots and the way you season it is you cook white rice in the pot so something like this or this and then you discard that rice and then you like you like wash it out really well and then you start over so that pretty much like seasons it but this is what I use most of the time. I just wanted to show you how to do this. Um, ideally, you want a heavier pot with um, a heavier lid. This is a Le Creuset, but there's a whole bunch of different like Le Creuset-like pots anymore. And that um, back there is just a commercial grade stainless steel. So a heavier stainless steel would work. All righty, thank you. And I don't know if it's Karen or Karen Hansen. Let me know if that answers your question because I know you were asking about the black pot. So Susan just um, gave a little bit more detail about that. So feel free to, you can either let us know in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and say yes or no. So um, let's see, a few more questions. Maria, I see that you unmuted yourself. Did you have a question? Or it may have been unmuted when you came back into the chat. So I'll just I'll just mute you right now in case you don't have a question. Okay, thank you. Let's see. All righty. I tend to pressure cook my rice, usually short grain brown rice, due to force of habit. Is this practice potentially too young for overall health? Yes. <laughs> you need to break that habit, um, especially the use of short grain brown rice. It's just so dry and so drying. And truthfully, you know, like when I, you know, like I get to go to different events and stuff. And even over the years, you know, like you would just like see people walk around, they start to like hunch over more and more. So that's like salt. And that's just like yang from all of this area in here, just like really contracting and, and changing. And then especially as people age naturally, because hormones begin to change you just begin to dry out, you know, like you dry out on the surface, but like internally too. So ideally you need more moisture. So that doesn't come from like drinking, you know, like eight huge glasses of water a day, but you get a lot of moisture from your food. So when you cook rice using less quantities and um, for you, I wouldn't even have brown rice every day. I would switch to medium grain. Um, I would switch to boiling or using a Donave pot if you're not already like combining it with other grains, then you need to start doing that because otherwise it just creates a whole lot of different problems. I mean, whether it's stuff, you know, like, I mean, there's like all kinds of degenerative illnesses that happen, but you'll see a lot of um, macrobiotic people that have like teeth problems. They'll have bone problems and you know, like they'll have like even like stiff joints and things like that. And um, you know, like all that really can be, um, circumvented when you just like use a different approach so getting stuck in the same thing that whole repetitious um routine is young in and of itself and when you find yourself getting in that repetitious routine all the time then you know ideally you want to change something all righty thank you let's see do you have sushi recipes in your cookbook? Geez, no, I probably don't. <laughs> it's something that we used to teach in, in the classes. I don't know that I do. Uh, I personally don't eat a lot of sushi. Um, I do love white rice with different things. Like I love white rice with natto. Um, I love white rice with beans or with beans and avocado. Um, but I don't usually take time to do nori rolls. Instead, what I'll do is I'll toast nori and then I'll fold it in half and then fold it in like fours and then like there make like little strips that are about like in like three or four inches by like an inch wide. And I'll eat that together with rice when, when I'm eating rice. Uh, and I like other condiments like um, sesame seeds with that. Or um, I love walnuts and a maboshi and toasted nori, just like, you know, like one of my favorite combinations. Um, or, you know, like sprouted pumpkin seeds and maboshi or shiso. It all works just like really nicely together. Uh, but just to do things, I mean, you can put like marinated tofu in sushi rolls. 
you just think what they do in Japanese restaurants. So like, you know, the avocado and cucumber, or just like umeboshi and cucumber. It's like the most simple thing that you can do. You could put fresh shiso leaves in there if you grow, um, like the green shiso works really well. If you don't have that, you could try mint. Uh, you could cook tempeh. So I do have recipes for marinated tofu um, and certain spreads that can be used um, in our book. Like there was one where I did um, like fried tempeh and added, uh, Wait, I think you can put guacamole in that. That works really, really well. Um, and the guacamole tends to like keep a little bit longer than the actual avocado. So yeah, there's a lot of different things that you can do. Maybe I'll have to do a class on it sometime. All righty, thank you, thank you. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Is that your... It's my phone. Okay. <laughs> the timer. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I thought there was another question about that there. Where did that question go? Can't delete questions. That's weird. All right. My brown rice is so dry and hard, not fluffy at all. What am I doing wrong? I just stopped making it. Hmm. Are you soaking it? <laughs> That's one question. Um, and it sounds like you're not adding enough um water to it. Uh, so it depends on how you're doing it. So you're either not using enough water you probably need some cooking lessons um i don't know where you live i have two people that are local that are interested in face-to-face in-person classes that um i'm going to start offering small group in-person classes here uh but we have just like a whole lot of different programs on the shi site if you're not local yeah that you know like i think really that's it or just like going through our book and really just like looking, reading the recipe first from top to bottom, like how to prepare it and reading the chapter on like soaking your rice and then like exactly how it's done. Yeah, she says she's not soaking her rice. Yeah. But it also sounds like you're not adding enough water too. If it's, if it's that dry, then something's not right. Okay. Oh, uh, let's see. Oh, uh, here we go. What is a good rice pudding? What is a what is a good rice pudding for a dessert? Um, I think I have one of those also in the Ultimate Guide to Eating for Longevity. In the back there, um, I'm pretty sure I have a rice pudding recipe. Uh, I have a rice pudding recipe where I'm actually using risotto rice. So it gets like really super creamy. Uh, my mom used to make rice pudding it was one of my favorite desserts as a kid so it is really good uh with raisins or some nuts and cinnamon um but it's also uh i think i have one for caramel rice pudding there which has like um, a combination of maple syrup and brown rice syrup and a little vinegar in there uh, and then that's like served with like some fresh berries it's just making it's a matter of really like making soft rice that you can i think it's hard to find amasaki anymore, but amasaki makes it more creamy. You could use like soy milk if you wanted to a little bit. Honestly, you don't really need to. You just uh, keep adding like more water to it to make it creamy. And if you want an actual special dessert that you plate up and make in a nice like um, like serving dish, dessert dish, then look for the recipe for the caramel rice pudding that's made with the risotto rice. We can also take some questions from our live audience as well, too. <laughs> yeah, my, my live audience here is asking me about a rice cooker. <laughs> Those lovely little electric things, so like the rice cooker. Um, you know, it makes a lot of people's life easy, but I don't really like cooking with the use of electric because it just like changes things. That can get like dry. Now, some people say, oh, no, it gets perfect. I find that the rice gets a little bit more dry, when, especially brown rice if it's cooked in a rice cooker. Um, not moist and fluffy like this. Uh, I'm going to like check this first. One of the Yanave pockets. I'm pretty sure this one is done, and it is done. Yes. Over. 
So here's the rice that's done. That's what it looks like in the pot. And I can like, you know, like push these guys off to the side here. And then if you were taking this out, the way you would do this, I'm just going to run this under water and gonna go around the pot, but this comes out really nicely. So you can see how now, Obviously, this is with a cracked grain, so it's going to be even more light, but that's a very light, fluffy rice. Very different from um, probably the pressure cooked rice that a lot of people are used to. I used to get a lot of compliments when we had our physical center on the rice that we made. And it's a little trickier, uh, cooking in quantity, cooking in quantity, pressure cooking does work better because things can get a little heavier as they sit and boil. But um, you actually use less than, than uh, one and a quarter and one and a third ratio for every cup of dry ingredients. And I used to like pressure cook that under pressure for like about an hour. And I wait five minutes and I would um, take the pressure down and release the valve. Move this off to the side. This off to the side. That's our brown rice with vulgar weight. The next one is going to be done really soon. Let me see, we got like five minutes to go. I'm going to peek. Somebody had a question here, and that was about uh, like um, adding different uh, grains to to brown rice. So the reason we recommend that is to keep the brown rice a, a little bit more light. And it's a great way to get more variety into your diet. So as we said before, variety is one of the most relaxing things that you can do to keep your condition more relaxed. When you're more relaxed, then you're going to be able to absorb nutrients better, but you're also going to be able to like discharge things better. Things that, you know, like we're always exposed to stuff that, you know, are not great or like, I mean, some people, eat every single meal at home, but like the vast majority of people, you're not going to like, you live like a monk and, um, that's my timer, sorry. And eat every single meal at home. So you still want to allow, um, yourself, uh, that flexibility to be able to discharge things that you don't want, meaning eliminate the excess. Uh, so if you're having a lot of rice, uh, that tends to tighten up your whole digestive area. And then when this becomes too tight or even a little bit, um, then uh, which just sets you up for a lot of different problems, then you may not be able to eliminate like excess as well. Uh, together with that, um, if you become too tight in the center here, then you may start craving foods that really don't serve you very well. Like, you know, um, an abundance of sweets. If with the sweets aren't cutting it, then maybe like some like really sugary sweets. That's not cutting it, then maybe like ice cream. And that's not an uncommon thing for people that just their internal condition becomes like way too tight, especially in today's age where we have pressure coming from the outside, pressure coming from like all kinds of cultural pressures, environmental pressures uh, that it's really, you know, like we try to keep ourselves just as relaxed as we can internally so that when things do come our way we're able to handle that a little bit better 
So this is our other rice. This is our boiled rice. And that has farro mixed with it. So if you notice that on the bottom, it's much more sticky there. So I usually like to go in and take the bottom part and move it to the top. So they look very similar. Maybe that's just because I'm, maybe that's just because I'm good at this. <laughs> so it does look very similar, but generally speaking, not just because this is a crack grain, um, just like the texture and the consistency, it's going to be, um, this will be a little bit heavier and uh, the Denabe pot kind of like a little bit lighter. So are there any other questions? Um, there's a couple more, and I think we'll have to keep these to be our last here. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Would you use a diffuser on an electric stove? You know, um, I've seen people use it on an electric stove. Um, I don't think it works very well, and especially like a lot of the new stoves, they have those um, infrared and infusion, you know, like, or is it an induction burner? Um, I don't think that would be a good idea because oftentimes the top is like a glass thing and that would scratch the glass. All righty. <clears throat> you can always buy a portable burner, like one of those butane burners and um, use that just like for important things like, you know, like your rice. Well, not that all things important, but. <laughs> I have to turn the flame off. Don't do that. <laughs> All right. And this will be our last question. And then, um, you know, Susan, you can definitely come in for a close and some updates regarding upcoming programs. Am I correct that it's good to use a flame tamer under a Denabe pot when you're cooking a pot of rice? Also, should it be cooked for about 50 minutes in a Denabe pot? Denabe pot? So this is the Donabe pot, this um, black pot right here. I do use a flame deflector underneath the Donabe pot. It's not scratched or anything like that. And it's, and this has been very, very well used for a number of years and not just by me, by my parents too. So there's, gets a little bit discolored because of sitting, you know, like on a gas range, but uh, nope. Uh, I use the flame deflector. Like I said before that disperses heat and energy, so it's not just like consolidating right at, at the bottom. And um, what was the other part of that question? So the connection went away. I lost it. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I hope that answers it. If it, that didn't answer it. Um, Yes, she said the longer the time or the longer time. Did you say? Oh, 50 minutes. Oh, oh 50 Denabe minutes. Pot, okay, yeah. then the Denami pot for 50 minutes. Uh, you can do 50 minutes. Uh, sometimes I do 40, sometimes I do 45. Again, it depends on what grain I'm cooking with it. So, especially if it's if barley, I will do 45 or 50 minutes. That was the last question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. I think we're still having a little bit of Zoom problems. I apologize for that. But uh, we really hope to see you again. Our next event coming up, I believe, is our Women's Health Conference. Uh, we have a really great lineup of people. I'm very excited about this. And we're getting like a lot of registrations coming in. And um, Tron's going to explain to you about like some offers that we're having but that only applies specifically for tonight so i hope you will register for that and join us uh, a, a lot of different topics on just like women's health anything from bone health to like just aging processes to health care personal care to movement 
um, to eating, um, like in like mood eating and eating um, disorders sort of thing. So lots of things going on. We hope you'll join us. That is March 15th through the 17th. Yes, that's going to be next week. And as Susan was saying, if you go to our website, I apologize. I wanted to send a link directly to the chat, but my other, the connection on my other end is not working. But if you go to our website, shimacrobiotics.org, you will see a link to the Women's Health Conference right on the main page. Um, only tonight, we did extend the early bird registration for those who didn't have an opportunity that were on tonight. Um, so that early bird registration will be still available until tonight only. And also, too, for those that are on this class only, you'll have a special discount code for an additional $5 off. And the code is RICE, so R-I-C-E. Um, I won't send that to the chat because it should be simple enough to, to remember. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to give us a call at the SHI number, which you can find on the website as well, too. And as always, I'll make sure to have a recording that is forwarded to everyone who attended this class and those who did not get a chance to attend within the next one to two business days. Once again, you can still access the early bird for the Women's Health Conference conference tonight. You can get additional $5 off using the code RICE, R-I-C-E. So thank you very much, everyone. We will see you hopefully next weekend on the 15th to the 17th for the conference. Have a good night. And feel free, you can unmute yourself and, you know, share your appreciations as well, too. Thank you, um, Taran and Susan. Excellent yes. class. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Carol. Thank you so much, yeah. Susan. It's so great thank to see you teaching those classes. And we'll always attend them. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Good night.